So I think we are ready to go. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Alex Ankua. I represent the community of software craftsmanship Romandy. And on my side, some side, there are uh, Yeah, here uh, I'm Peti Koch from the Java User Group Switzerland. And so today we're going to present, we have an event and we have Nicola Kahlo that's going to present a, soft, a set, seven technique to tame the legacy code base. And I think, uh, Petty, you have a few things to present before we launch, Nicola. Yeah, uh, I have a couple of slides to show. Uh, please uh, type into the chat, where are you from? Um, Nicolas, uh, today we, it's kind of international. Nicolas is from Montreal in Canada. And, exactly. Uh, Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm wondering where you uh, are out there. So, okay, so today, First, a big thank you to the sponsors of the Java User Group Switzerland for their ongoing support. Then uh, for you as participant, you're already using the chat. That's cool. I see it's working. So Gallen, Zürich, Baden, Hungary. Oh, Hungary. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, if you have questions, please uh, post them in the question and answers tab. It's right beside the chat. And you have the possibility to upvote the questions. So we have the most interesting questions uh, on the top of the list. Then finally, um, we will pick up the questions after the talk. So there will be around 45 minutes talk. And then we will try to answer all your questions. If you have uh, questions to the Java user group, Switzerland, or ideas for upcoming events, feel free to use our Slack workspace. You see here the, the link to it. Um, and then if you had, uh, you want to follow the community of uh, software craftsmanship, uh, craft uh, Romandi, you have here the link. It's the same, it's on the meetup. Uh, it's going to write in English and French, even if the link has a German link. <laughs> <laughs> That's from uh, Petit. Oh, sorry. I have to update the slides. <laughs> yeah, and no, also, you have say. many more members <laughs> in the meantime. <laughs> yeah, many more the members. Uh, we're going to have in the for this outtune, we have a few speakers. So we have speaker every two weeks uh, in the craftsmanship community. Uh, one week in France. Uh, uh, Two, every two, every month uh, in French, every month in English. It's every two weeks like this. Uh, next speaker, English speaker, we're going to have uh, Adrian Bolboaca, the brother of uh, Alex that we had already uh, this spring. Uh, he's going to present a subject about uh, per programming in remote. Uh, then we're going to have Jonathan. I forget his name, um, Jonathan Martinson is going to present a subject about bug free. And at the end of the year in December, we're going to have Dragon uh, Stebavonoki. Uh, but for the moment, I don't know his subject. That's it. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Um, we will record this session um, and we will publish it later on our YouTube channel. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will get a notification uh, when you click the bell um, as well. Yeah, you're going to have the link to in the, inside the uh, Craft Community uh, YouTube channel too. That's Same. it. Yeah. Same. That's yeah. So, as already said, in uh, if you want to get notified about the upcoming events, um, there's a possibility to sign up for the newsletter on the Java User Group Switzerland homepage um, and uh, join the meetup group of, uh, of the Software Crafts Romandy and you will automatically get notifications for the next events. Um, after the talk and the Q&A, um, the session here in Big Marker will end and we will be automatically forwarded to wonder.jog.org. 
.ch, so you don't have to do any uh, anything. It will, uh, it will happen automatically. It's for those who want to stay, stick around and have a discussion. Um, it's really a nice platform and it's, it's totally open and free and you can come and go as, as you want. It's a good opportunity to, to speak to each other in person. Maybe uh, I think, Nicolas, you will stay also. I will stay around. Yeah, so, I'm excited because I'm missing uh, just, you know, staying around and meeting people you don't know already, uh, like if it were in real life. <laughs> Okay, that's everything from the organization side. So I'll hand over to Nicolas. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to share my screen. You should be able to see the slides now. Yes. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to talk about legacy code and how to work with that. So if you're here, I guess that you are very interested in hearing about that because that's what you're de dealing with. Um, first of all, I'm going to start with the definition of legacy code because there are many definitions out there. So I will be using mine for this talk. I define legacy code as profitable, valuable code that you are afraid to change. Um, there are two important nuances. First, profitable, in the sense that you cannot just rewrite all of this and, and ditch uh, the code you have because people are probably using it in production. Uh, they're depending on it. And I would even say it probably pays for your salary. Uh, it's very likely that you're working on legacy code base because you're working for a company that is successful somehow and they have all of this existing code that made them successful and you need to keep maintaining that and still you're afraid to change that so maybe it's because there is no test but that can also be very subjective um, if you have been working with that code base for a couple of years then you start becoming much more confident doing changes even though it's still not tested for example so there are things you can do on yourself to help you uh, not be so afraid of working with such code bases. So this is part of what we're going to see here. Here is a screenshot of you in your code base. And I know it's realistic because uh, we have all been there. Um, if you have documentation, you're lucky, but it's very likely outdated. You probably have no test, or at least the part you want to change has no test, of course. And the biggest problem for the moment is that you have short deadlines. Like you cannot take weeks to clean up everything like that. No, you still need to fix bugs and to ship new features, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's kind of a race. So with short deadlines, how do you um, clean up all of this? How do you work with this legacy code base and make it better instead of worse every single day while delivering value? My name is Nicholas. Um, I am currently a senior developer working for a company named Centered. Uh, I will talk about that later because it's kind of also related to what I'm talking about here. And I also blog uh, very frequently on uh, understandlegacycode.com. So this is, this is a topic I've been working a lot with uh, because I have this weird passion of working with legacy code bases and more seriously because I'm really into uh, craft uh, and all of these techniques and working with legacy code has been a big part of my career because I was a consultant before. So I've seen a lot and uh, I was really into finding techniques. And today, this is what we're gonna dive into. Uh, seven different techniques, um, very different because hopefully you may discover some of them and maybe some of them you already know, we will see. Um, and they are very different, so you will probably not use all of them right away, but I want to give you the taste of it, so you will want to pick one or two. Take that as a buffet. I am proposing to you all of these, and if you want to use one, uh, that can help you probably at work. Okay, we're going to start with ADRs. If you don't know ADRs yet, this stands for Architecture Decision Record. Maybe you have heard of that already, or maybe you're very familiar with it, because I am pleased to see that it is becoming more and more popular. Um, but if you don't know it yet, I'm about to tell you what it is. It's a kind of documentation, 
but it's the documentation that doesn't suck because it never gets outdated. And uh, how is that even possible? Well, because the goal here is not to really document what the system is doing. It's not like an evergreen document that may diverge from what the code is actually doing. The goal of an ADR is to capture context. And you put that in a time capsule that you can retrieve later, uh, whether that's you or someone else who would be maintaining that code. When you're taking decisions every single day when you're working with that code base, and uh, the problem is six months from now, you will forget what are the reasons why you took that decision, all of the context around that. So ADR is here for that. And the good thing is that you cannot be wrong. Like The more you add, the better, because you're just capturing what's the reality for you today. You cannot be wrong. Like you're justifying, just explaining why you're taking this decision. Uh, here is an example. So you see, it's just a markdown file, so nothing fancy. Um, four major uh, components of an ADR, and that's enough. First, the title of the ADR, so that's an easy one. Then the context. Uh, the context is everything that justifies that decision. So that may be your current constraints, the system you're working with, your environment, uh, maybe stuff that are not part of the code, maybe things that you know or you're familiar with, or the things that you don't really know how to do, like anything that will explain why you're taking that decision. Then the decision itself, so this is the title, but with some more words, and eventually you can drop some links here. And finally, the consequences, very important, the consequences, if you take a decision, that is to achieve something. You probably have some benefits to it, that's for sure. List them. Also, you may have some trade-offs. Uh, not everything is perfect and something may be, become more difficult to do because of that decision, but that's a trade-off you're, you're taking because of the context uh, around that decision. So that's the best decision you can take today. So this was an example from uh, uh, my previous uh, company and uh, it was written when, year ago, and it actually was helpful because the developer who wrote that ADR left the company. And then six, seven months later, we went, we ran into an issue and uh, this helped us understand why he did that, uh, remind us why he did that. So um, uh, that paid off uh, six months later. It's not just us. Uh, here is an example from the UK Ministry of Justice. And you can find many examples online for, of open source uh, projects that are doing that. As you can see, these are all marked on files that you will version uh, along your code base. Uh, so it's easy to find information because if you control F within your whole project, you may have, uh, you may find an, an ADR that will bring you more, some more context, maybe or maybe not, but at least you have more chances to find information if you capture some decisions from time to time. Uh, I put you a link to uh, ADR tools, which is a CLI that will generate the boilerplate for you. So basically it generates the markdown. You just type the title in your terminal and then you fill the blanks. And I find it's a very nice addition to pull request. Um, if I'm installing a new dependency, I will explain why I'm choosing this dependency over another one to achieve that uh, feature. And I will put an ADR and that ADR will be also my PR description kind of. Um, so it's very convenient. All right, next technique I want to share with you. I call that the brain dump. And this is uh, based on uh, actually the programmer's brain. Uh, I'm, I'm going to drop also the links uh, later. And you will have access to the slides with all of the links. So do not worry about that. But basically, it's not just the programmer's brain, but really how anyone's brain is working. And you may or may not know, but your short-term memory is limited. Uh, there is only a few items that you can remember at once, and that is around seven. This matters because when you're working with a legacy lamp of code, there are many things going on. You will see many things that you want to clean up. Uh, there are side effects a bit everywhere, and it's hard to keep everything in your brain as you're processing the code and trying to understand what's going on. 
And uh, it's very easy to get distracted because of all of this. And I say that in 2021 now, um, you could have something that we would call a second brain. Imagine uh, as you're interacting with the code, you could just take all of this information that is uh, flowing to you and you put that on the side on, on some storage that you can tap into at any time that frees your mind so you can just stay focused on the one thing you were doing. And I'm saying 2021 because this technology exists and this is the, what I call the PNP protocol. And PNP really stands for pen and paper. And I know I'm trolling a little bit here because you might be thinking, am I seriously advising you to just take notes? Uh, and it's one of the seven techniques. Yes and no. Uh, I like to think about that just like meditation in the sense that, uh, well, it's common knowledge in the sense that, yeah, meditation is good and anyone can meditate. The question is not, uh, can you meditate, but do you actually meditate and do it properly? So that's the same with taking notes. It's not just about having a pen and paper and drafting stuff on the side. It's about having a deliberate process of using that pen and paper to support you working with that code base and with really anything. Um, here is how to use it properly, according to me. Well, one way that will help you uh, interact with such a code base, um, you want to do one thing. So write it down on that paper and you can make, even circle it. And that's the one thing you want to do. Then try to do that. And when you will be going in that code base and diving into the, this jungle, you will see a lot of things that you want to do things you want to clean up, things that are not clear, something you want to rename, whatever. Instead of just getting striking and doing them and then getting lost, write this down. Write down the other things that you could do or you may need to do, but are not directly related to what you're doing at the moment. Write them down. Use your paper to drop all of this and stay focused. This will avoid you getting into what we call this tunnel effect. The tunnel effect, you may be familiar with that. It is when you you don't really know if uh, you're near the end or if you should rather go back to the beginning. Uh, one of the symptoms is when it has been five stand-ups that you're here and saying, well, I'm almost done. Uh, maybe I will be done tomorrow. We'll see. Uh, like you don't have visibility when you're in such a situation and you need to take a step back and use a different approach. When nothing is working anymore and you don't know when you will get back to working state, this is where you will really benefit from just taking a piece of paper and using it so you only do one thing at a time. Next up, I'm gonna talk about comment. How often do you comment? And, uh, you may feel that you're not commenting enough often. Uh, doing small comments, is, it's something that many people are telling you to do probably, um, but it's always hard to do, I found. So I found also a way to do that that I think can train you because it trained me into doing much smaller comments. And to do so, um, I recommend you have some sort of timer, but not any kind of timer, a, a gym timer. I like a gym timer because it's it's actually very cheap to acquire. And what you will do is you will set an interval, five minutes, for example, uh, for one hour. And then you put that in your pocket. And every five minutes, it doesn't distract you and stop you uh, in whatever you were doing, just like a regular timer will do. It will just buzz gently in your pocket so you will notice. but it's a very subtle notification, so you can stay focused, but it will be a subtle reminder of, hey, maybe you should do a comment now. Maybe not, it's up to you, but after five minutes of coding, maybe you have a few things that are worth doing a comment and you should comment now. So I would practice this technique for a while, like uh, an hour every day, for example, for a while. And then eventually I ended up uh, naturally creating small comments by myself without even realizing it. This is an example of a uh, pull request of earlier this year. And I noticed that some of my comments are spaced like 10 seconds away. 
And you may be wondering, is that really helpful? Well, yes, it is helpful because when you review that commit, uh, they are much easier to review. Actually, someday I had this confirmation from the other people I'm working with, not just myself when I'm reviewing my content, others. I was concerned because my PR was bigger than I, I'm used to, and uh, I was afraid it was hard to review. And my coworker, she told me, uh, no worries, because actually I learned that when she reviews my code, she usually goes comment by comment because she can kind of follow what I did uh, with very small comments to review it every single time. So she looks at the big picture and then she goes into my journey and she found that I'm very well organized. And that's funny because I, I don't reorganize my comments so much. Like I, I just comment and then I push everything. I rarely reorganize everything afterwards. Uh, but because my comments are so small and do one thing, then at the end, it's relatively easy to follow what I did. It also helps you prevent, you know, getting distracted, the tunnel effect, all of that. And um, having smaller comments makes it easier to try something and then uh, go back to a previous state that you know was working and that was not far away. So I suggest you try that. Uh, I recommend you use a team timer, but any kind of interval timer that you don't have to touch uh, will be the best. And not just for committees more often, actually. I also use that these days to uh, train me to drink more often water because when I'm really focused on what I'm doing, I forget about drinking. But this five minutes little reminder uh, interval is very nice so I can drink and I don't get uh, sidetracked from what I was doing. Now, let's talk about the Mikado method. Um, if you thought during the brain dub that this is nice, but it's not really a process and you will like a process to do things better, well, the Mikado method is exactly that. It's a brain dump but with a process. So the goal again is when you're lost, when what you have to work with is really uh, hairy, you have so many things going on, it pays off to start a micadograph. Here is how you do that. First, you write down the one thing you want to achieve, your goal. That could be uh, the, the, the title of the ticket you're working on, whatever. Then you start a timer. So here I put five minutes. Actually, I would re more recommend like 10 minutes. Um, I don't recommend doing bigger uh, time intervals and I'm gonna explain why in a second. And during this time slot, like five minutes, 10 minutes, you choose, you try to achieve that goal. Of course, after 10 minutes, this is very likely to happen. Uh, you cannot achieve that because if you could do that thing within 10 minutes, you would probably not have felt the need to write it down in the first place. You would just have to do it and that's it. And that is interesting. If after 10 minutes, you cannot do the one thing you wanted to do, that means the change you need to do isn't really easy or you don't really understand what change you exactly need to do. So stop here. When the timer rings, stop here and think, okay, what have you learned during this 10 minutes? Uh, write that down. What is blocking you from achieving your goal? Maybe you need to investigate more uh, on something or maybe you need to do something first. You need to refactor a part of the code because it's really uh, tangled and you cannot do your change with all of this within 10 minutes at least. So write these sub goals, connect them to the main goal they're related to. Uh, and this is very important. You need to revert your changes. You need to get back to a clean state. If you, if you did some code during this 10 minutes, stop, uh, revert. Uh, and if you really don't like to revert, stash, that's fine. But you really need to go back to a clean state. That is super important. It's part of the process, really. Then you pick one of the sub goals, so something that should be easier to do, and you start again. You start over, and after 10 minutes, you will see eventually at some point, after 10 minutes, and probably after like two or three minutes, or maybe 30 seconds, you will be able to complete something at least, <laughs> at last. Um, this is great. When, when you're able to complete something, First, you get this little dopamine shot of, oh, I did, I did it. I did that one little small thing. 
that is getting me closer to the end goal. So you can cross it off your graph. And it's also a good moment to commit. So if you were worried about committing more often or doing smaller commits, well, if you're following that technique, your commit will contain less than 10 minutes of work. Usually that's small enough. And then you start again, you do a commit and then you pick another sub goal and you continue. And hopefully the more you complete, the easier it becomes to achieve that bigger sub goals and then the goal itself. Eventually, I found that at the end, from the ex uh, outside world, like the people reviewing your code, for example, they will feel like you're speed running through all of this and they don't really, like, they're impressed because they say, oh, you're reliable every single time you, you tell me that you should be done by then and, and you are, uh, and you find a nice way to cut all of these into smaller PRs. How do you do that? Because usually my PR, they're big and they contain everything because, well, everything is tangled together. And the secret is that every single time you die, you don't know in advance, but every single time you die, you revert back in time a little bit, and then you try another way. And eventually at the end, yes, that's what it looks like. It's just that you have this approach to solving the problem that works. It's a bit abstract, so I'm going to give you a concrete example of how, what it looks like. And I want to emphasize on the uh, two phases that it will happen. First step, uh, you want to achieve that. So you start your day, you say, okay, I'm going to refactor, calculate intermediate charges because it's, it's a mess. Uh, I need to do that. So that's what I want to achieve. 10 minutes after 10 minutes, I cannot do that. It's, it's so vague and it's so big. Um, but I've identified four things that I could do first. So I didn't waste 10 minutes. I learned what needs to be done first. I pick another one, 10 minutes, try again, and I fail. And I do that again, and I fail. And I do that again, and I fail. You can see the graph is growing, and that is phase one. I think that is important because at this stage, you may be able to complete a few things, but more importantly, you're discovering everything that was hidden. When you did your initial estimation of how much that will take, that was a guess. Now you're starting to get a clear picture of everything. So all of that time, these 40 minutes you spend on this code, not only you get more familiar with it, maybe you did achieve a few things, but more importantly, now you have a bigger picture of, okay, what really needs to be done to complete that? And you're starting doing this already. Then eventually something happens. You enter in a new phase uh, where productivity strikes, I would say. Because you have this map of everything you need to know, now you start achieving things in order and there are small things that you can do. And the more you achieve, the easier it becomes to achieve others that were bigger. And eventually you will feel that, oh, you're just crushing through it. You can also stop at any time and be able to ship intermediate pull requests. That is nice when you have a change, like one goal that is very, very big and that could take a lot of time to complete. Not necessarily the case, but it is nice to know that you usually can ship part of this graph. And eventually at some point you will end up here and this is a very nice place to end up because it means that you're 10 minutes away from completing your goal. I found this is also really helpful to give something more meaningful during standard, for example, or discussing with your colleagues then. I'm almost done. It's not, I, I'm almost done. There is all of this that needs to be done. And now I have a clear picture and I'm here. And then we can discuss, do we want to do all of this? Uh, do we reestimate that? Like whatever, we can have a meaningful discussion. It, this is not from me. There is a book on that technique and um, I would recommend you not to buy it now uh, because if you're like me, you will see, oh, there is a book. Nice. I'm going to add that to my wish list of book to read. And eventually I will buy it, but it will be a long time before I actually read it. And I will never apply the technique until I've read the book because I need to know how to do it correctly before I do it, right? That is procrastination. Don't do that. I told you everything you need to know to get started. So I suggest you start with this. And you will have questions because there are nuances and edge cases that you will get into 
this is the moment when you have these questions where I, I advise you to buy the book and find the answers to your question. This is a much more efficient approach to actually changing the way you're working than just waiting for all the theory to load in your brain before you actually start doing it. I shared with you a tool that I really like to do this online, especially useful when I want to collaborate or uh, because we're all remote now. But really, to do these graphs, you, you can use a pen and paper also if you're on your own, or a whiteboard if you have that. Uh, that works. That's, no technology is required to do that. OK, we have talked about way for you to organize your work. Now I'm going to dive into more a technical lead perspective. How do you prioritize the work you have to do? When it comes to productivity in general and personal organization, for example, uh, there is one saying that you may know, which is, when everything is urgent, nothing is. And that is right. Like when you have 50 uh, tickets and they're all urgent, you still need to start somewhere. So you just lost your ability to pick the most important one. A simple tool that we have to prioritize stuff we have to do is the Heisenauer matrix. Uh, basically, you have two uh, dimensions, the urgency, like when do you need to do that, and the importance, how bad it is if you don't do it. And you categorize stuff in these boxes. So you will have four boxes. Start with what is important, you really need to do that, and urgent, you need to do that by tomorrow. The not urgent or not important ones can be delegated or tackled after. Eventually, they will become urgent after all. And eventually, what is not urgent and not important, we suggest you drop it uh, because, especially if you have many things to do, that will come back, either because it will become more important or because it will become urgent, and then you that will change. Uh, that is about productivity in general. That has nothing to do about code, or does it? When you ask someone, a consultant like me, I was doing that, to uh, assess the health of the code base and to devise a plan to make it better, usually we go and reach for uh, static analysis tools. Uh, they give you a score on the code base and the breakdown per file, and they list you the issues that you have in this code base. Eventually, some of them will tell you how many time they estimate it will take for your developers to to clean up all of that. Um, here is an example of an actual code base, an open source code base, very popular. It's, I think it was React. Uh, yeah, score is D, and it will take eight years to clean up all of that depth. You cannot go and talk to your stakeholders and say, "Hey, well, you know what? You, if you want to increase your our velocity, we really need to stop for eight years for delivering value, and then we will be super fast." So, what do you do? Uh, usually, what I see most of the time is that people will prioritize per criticity. So, like they will take the most critical issues reported by the tool, and they will start fixing these. This is the importance, how bad it is. But it actually doesn't tell you the urgency. Do you really need to, to fix it now? What do you need to fix it first? The urgency, you actually have this information, and it is present in version control. So if you are using Git, basically, you have this information already embedded in your code. It is just that you're probably not using it yet. So I'm going to tell you how to use it. You want to. Ask yourself, how often do you touch that code? Because if that code is terrible, but you never really have to touch it anymore, you don't care it is terrible. You don't have to clean it. And you may have a gut feeling about what is uh, touched often and what is not, especially if you have been working with that code base for a while. But you can get that information from Git also and compare with your gut feeling. So here is the command to get the 50 files you touched the most in the past year. Usually past year is enough. You reach for git log. You get the names of the files of the past 12 months. You get rid of the fancy formatting. 
then you filter out anything that doesn't really matter. So anti lines for sure, but you could grab any um, Markdown file or configuration file, like JSON file or whatever. You don't want to be part of this uh, results. Then you can sort them uh, and count them. And then you sort them again, so you will have the count number, and um, you you can sort them uh, by uh, the most frequently frequent occurrence of these files. And finally, you take the first fifty, and that comment on any Git project gives you the list with the number of occurrences of the files that are touched the most. You put that on a graph, a any solution, I am not giving you a specific tool to do that, but really you have your scores from your static analysis and profile, and then you have your code churn profile. You put that on a graph and you focus on the files that are touched often and that are particularly bad. So here is an example of the Docker engine, which I'm not familiar with at all. Uh, if I were to give advice on this, like where should we start cleaning up this technical debt? One of the files is really terrible. On the top uh, left here, there is a one red file at, at the top. It, it, this one is terrible. But this one, which is a little bit better, like daemonunix.go, it is a little bit better, but we touch that every single time we, we use the code base almost. So it is very often used. This is your pain point. You should tackle this one first and leave this one alone for the moment, that's fine. So regardless of the size of your code base, in my experience, you have this kind of curve and then you will see the outliers on the top right quadrants uh, around here. And these are the files you should first tackle. The rest can wait. Uh, when you don't have any file here, you're in a good position, and then you can start addressing the outliers like this one, which is far from the uh, from the curve you can imagine here. Uh, this is how you come up with a plan. And then you can present these graphs to stakeholders who are not technical, and you talk to them about the uh, return on investment because uh, spending some time, like uh, one week or 20% of the of, of for, uh, time fixing this file will uh, reduce the, the um, will increase our velocity. So the return on investment on this little chunk of the code base uh really worth it and you need to not talk technical stuff like they don't care about the critical uh issues and technicalities about the technical depth what they care about is they want to increase the velocity yes tell them how to do that and what's the plan that doesn't involve eight years of maintenance before we can ship anything this is the kind of approach that can give you such arguments to talk with stakeholders Okay, it's almost the end. Now I'm gonna share one of my favorite techniques when you're working with a code that is not tested. Unfortunately, this uh, could be very long. I actually have a whole talk just on this technique because there are a lot of things to mention. So I'm just gonna give you an overview of what it is and I'm gonna put some links to dig further. It is called approval testing. You may know that under different names such as characterization testing or golden master if sure uh, that old uh, or maybe you were doing that without really knowing it as a name approval testing is a really nice name because you will find a lot of tools around that with the approval testing keywords uh, in google so the gist of it what the system does more important than what it should do be careful of what people think the system is doing even in business people Sometimes you don't really know, but you probably are aware of that. What the system is actually doing is more important. In particular, I have found some times where clients were depending on bugs. And uh, fixing the bug will actually create other problems. So you just need to be aware of it, like preserving what the system is doing, even if it's not something that was expected is important. And once you have highlighted that, uh, you can do your changes and then have a discussion about what the system is doing. The problem is here, remember, 
you have short deadlines, you have no test. This is the context I am talking to. Uh, so you know that you should be writing this test. The problem is that you don't really know what the system is doing in the first place. So understanding what the system is doing will take time. And then writing the test and comprehensive tests like unit tests, proper unit tests, that will also take a lot of time because you have to learn what the system is doing. Usually that's worth it, but I found that people, and that's understandable, they don't do it because they still have that short deadline. So yeah, that's nice, but it's out of my comfort zone. I don't have the time. I will do it like that this time and then next time maybe. So approval test is nice because it is the fastest way I know to write tests that are missing on existing code. And you're gonna see why it's so fast. It's because you don't really need to understand what the system is doing, but you need to capture it. So here, first step is to generate an output that you can put into a file. Basically, you need to find a way to generate a string from running part of the system. That can be a big part, that can be a small part you want to refactor. Basically, you want to tackle that, you need to generate an output you can put in a, in a file. So easiest way is when your uh, function returns some value, then you take that value, you put that in a file. If your function is doing some side effect, then maybe you need to uh, inject, uh, I don't know, you could maybe inject a logger, something that will capture interesting facts inside when the code executes, and that will do nothing in production. Uh, but then in your test, at the end, you take the output and you put that in a file. That works. Anything you find that can run this test, this code and log something that will stay the same. And if you can do that, you're almost done. So I'm not going to lie. This is where most of the magic happened. And this is where you will find more content online on how to do so because many edge cases. But this is the first important step. And once you're done, you're almost done. Next step is to use something you are familiar with, test coverage. I like test coverage for one thing, finding what I am not testing. This is the perfect tool to tell you, okay, you know what, this code path, you're for sure you're not getting into it. So use test coverage to find the places you're not testing and that matters. Like if you don't, if you don't need to touch that part and it's red, it's fine. But if you know that you are gonna work on this, uh, the test coverage will tell you, okay, you need to do something because this for the moment is not covered. Now, when everything you want to touch is green, uh, the, it doesn't mean that you're actually testing it. Be careful of that. Uh, that's the trip, uh, the trick with test coverage is that you don't know uh, if you're actually testing things properly. So what I like to do is to introduce a silly mistake like a mutation to verify your snapshots. Really, it's, for example, I will comment out uh, line 22 and run the test. If there is one test failing, I'm good. If there's no test failing, I need to find a new combination. Approval testing, and if you will look for that keyword, you will find approvaltest.com. They have a lot of libraries to help you do that. And usually they help you uh, brute force any kind of combination into that function. Uh, so yes, it will generate a lot of tests. For example, this one test is generating four, 24 combinations of uh, inputs, and there will be a lot of overlap. I like to think about it just like you take a big bucket of paint and you throw that onto the wall. It's not perfect, you won't get all the edge cases, but if you wanted to have something fastly painted so you can start doing something, it is efficient. It is the same here. We don't know exactly what this is doing. What we do is we send all of this inputs and combination onto the function. So when we introduce mutations, we see that, okay, there is at least one test covering it and we capture the behavior. From there, you are safer, quickly safer. Uh, you can start refactoring the code. And when you will refactor the code, this is where you really understand what, you, what this code is doing or is supposed to do. And you will write new unit tests that make sense out of it. Um, 
And then you can start changing the behavior the way you want it while preserving the existing behaviors. I usually would remove the approval test once I'm done. It's meant to be temporary, not to be there because these are not high quality tests. Although there are ways you can also uh, use uh, approval tests for much more. If you come up with something we call the printer, so if you have, if you understand what the code is doing and you have a nice uh, way to print the output, that actually can be also a very nice way to visualize the behavior of the system. And you could actually use that and keep that uh, in the code base. But these are experiments we're doing with MAD Bash, for example, and all the approvaltest.com community. I sent you a link here to dig into this further. Um, but approval testing is really, really powerful technique. Finally, uh, let's talk about coding CADAS. So this is not precisely a technique to help you uh, work with a, with a legacy code base right away, but it's something that is super important in my opinion. This is a picture of artists performing in front of an audience. Um, and the thing is, I realized that these artists, they practice a lot before performing and between performance even. And not just artists actually, people like pilots, for example, they will practice a lot flying before they actually perform that in production. When do we as developers practice our skills of working with existing code? And yeah, that's right. At work on this legacy code base that is running in production and that we need to change. When we're doing that, we're not practicing. We're performing, right? You cannot mess up with all of this. You need to be careful. So really, I found that we really rarely have the time to practice. And this is why I am mentioning coding canas. First thing, you need to find where you can practice your skills. Coding katas are exercises you can use to practice any kind of skills. Uh, you have plenty of katas to create from scratch some you know, application or something that does something using constraints. So you can try technologies or you can try design patterns, etc. Some of the coding katas uh, are designed for refactoring. So you start with existing code and you need to add test and refactor. Eventually, you need to implement a new feature without breaking the existing behavior. So that's where it starts looking like work, except it's in the playground. The goal is not to complete the exercise. We don't really care. Uh, many people have completed that. And the goal is to start over and over again. That's why it's called a kata. The goal is to try techniques, new techniques, or techniques you already know, but you want to practice because you're not very sure about how you execute that correctly. I have listed five katas that are really good, and starting with the most easiest one and, and uh, the one I would recommend, the Gilded Rose. Um, if you never practiced refactoring kata before, start with this one. Uh, it's available in many languages, and uh, you have it's, it's a very popular one, so you have a lot of resources online about this. You can see people doing it, etc. And then I listed others that are more involving and that will look like um, a production code for real. The, the Trivia Kata, for example, really has randomness and STD out in there. So you have to deal with these kind of side effects. Now, when do you practice? Because this is all nice, but when do you practice? If you're lucky, you may be practicing at home. You're passionate about that and you will take on your evenings and weekends to do that. I did that a lot. And I say I did that a lot because now I have a daughter and she's two years old today and I don't have my weekends anymore to really work and, and do computer stuff. I want to enjoy time with her and with my family. So I don't spend that much time on my own uh, working and practicing anymore. Uh, but your company has a budget, a training budget. That training budget is probably used to send you to conferences, and that is nice, and also probably send, um, used to train you on soft skills or new technologies, new frameworks, new tools, etc. If you don't use your training budget, you should really do something that's strange. Uh, that is great. What I'm uh, suggesting here is that someday, some year, you take some of that budget to practice your refactoring and 
working with legacy code skills because that will apply throughout your career. I found myself spending much more time working with existing code I didn't wrote that is poorly tested, poorly documented, and people who wrote that code are gone than working on the Greenfield new project, all shiny, that is not yet in production. So this skills really useful. Um, use your training budget, hire a coach. There are a few coaches that can do that for you. They can coach your team. I did that with my previous teams and that was amazing. There is something called a code retreat that is organized maybe by the Software Crafters uh, Romandie uh, community. Uh, there is a global day of code retreat every single year. Uh, community crafters community around the globe they are doing that exercise for a whole day. You can join. You will join other people and you will pair program on an exercise and trying different constraints. That is super great. And my last techniques. It's like if your company culture is not really into that kind of thing. Uh, Schedule a one-hour meeting every two weeks, for example, with other developers who are interested. And you say that you're synchronizing the systems or whatever, like it's a technical one-hour meeting. Usually I found that in these companies, uh, it's fine to schedule a one-hour meeting with other people to, to talk. So why, you don't, why don't you schedule a one-hour meeting where inside that meeting, you will put some code uh, on the screen, uh, coding Kata, and try to practice together or on your own. And then at the end, you discuss all of these. That is a very great way to learn while you're at work. And it won't take much, like one hour meeting every two weeks probably goes unnoticed. But the effect on your productivity over time, uh, at least for you and your sanity, it, it will make a difference, I can tell you. So that's it. Uh, these are my seven techniques. And I will uh, open a poll very soon to ask you from all of these techniques, which ones are you, do, you, do you really want to try uh, at work? But I also do have a bonus stage for you. Um, if you want to go further, so this is a little bit like my promotion, but what I'm working on is really related to that. Because I, as you can tell, it's kind of my passion. And I'm not the only one who had a weird passion for legacy code. Uh, I can tell you more about that, but there is a community of people like me. Um, something I work, I'm working on, I told you at the very beginning, I'm working on the, for a startup called Centered, and we are developing a product that is uh, tailored for personal productivity. I'm really into personal productivity, and that goes hand to hand with legacy code. Because I told you, legacy code, many things are going on. It's hard to feel productive. Think about all of these days where you end the day and you feel you had so many meetings scattered through the day and then fires and distractions and all the notifications. So you don't really feel efficient and maybe you stay late at work because of that. Please don't do that too much because you will burn yourself out. I have paired with people and actually a lot of people uh, who got notification every 30 seconds on the top right of the screen. And that is super distracting. So there are things you can do on your own to be more efficient when you work, to get in the zone. You know the zone, it's this flow state we call that. It's this moment where you, you really are into what you're doing and, and everything connects together and you're, you're, uh, you're going through uh, the work you have to do, especially when it's difficult. Things you can do to make that happen. Uh, decide what to work on before. So the brain dump and all of these techniques, decide what you're gonna work on and decide on the time slots. Okay, I'm gonna work for 45 minutes on this, or I'm gonna do this for 15 minutes. I guarantee that when you explicitly do that, you are much more engaged and harder to distract from what you were supposed to do because you exactly know what you're supposed to do. Put some music, I would even say put some ritual in place to get you into that brain mode. Uh, start a timer, take regular breaks, and turn off notifications. Uh, really, for not the whole day, but like, okay, I'm going to do that for 25 minutes. And I 25 minutes block notifications and I'm going to work. Or maybe for two hours. If you work for two hours, have, have a reminder to take a break, a five minute break somewhere because it will actually be helpful to step out for a bit, uh, lay, let your mind wander a little bit and then come back to the computer 
after five minutes, it helps being productive. Finally, focus. So this is something I, I try to do on my own, et cetera, but this is also the, the one thing we're working on that centered. Uh, it's very new. It's also in development. Uh, there is a version online. Next week, we're going to ship another version, which is bringing task management along with uh, something we call the flow hall. It's changing fast, but it's designed for that. I'm using it myself, so I really want something to help me work uh, with this code base. I managed to get a discount code. Well, it's easy because it's a startup, so I just asked for it. But the tool is free. The premium. Uh, you can be also a premium member. It's like $10 a month, but um, really it's nice because you got things like uh, nudges, automating nudges if you're on Twitter, for example, because you're waiting CI to pass, so you, you got distracted that's your queue to go to Twitter, but if you go on Twitter, you will have a little sound that tells you, are you, are you getting distracted? Yes, I am. Okay, so uh, premium is really nice for a such uh, thing. And with this code legacy, you can have uh, two free months to try out the tool. And uh, if you're trying it out, please let me know what do you think about it and how can I improve that tool because uh, that I'm working on it for me, but I'm interested in, of course, uh, making it useful for other people so I can earn my life out of it, right? Um, finally, if you love what I share to you and you'll learn one or two things and you want more, uh, I do, I do have more because it has been a long time I'm, I'm working on this. I put a collection of 14 techniques into an ebook, 200 pages with code examples, a diagram and more a deep dive into it. Um, and I call that the first ed kit because it's not so much a book, but really a catalog of 14 recipes you can use. Uh, when you have no time, no test, what do you do? So with this link that you will have access to, you get a 30% discount. And this, well, this is my way also to thank you for these uh, 50 minutes you spend listening to me and everything I had to say. Now, that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to open the poll now, and you will be able also to start uh, asking questions and vote if you didn't already. So you see, I have my piece of paper on the side <laughs> and I wrote down what I needed to do beforehand so I don't forget and I don't have to remember about it. I just have to look on the right and I know what I need to do next. So it's really a way of working. Okay. Um, So I can see the questions. We already have a few questions here. So maybe, Petty, you want to jump in and... Yeah, I think with the poll, it's going strong. Uh, we have 33 responses and 44 attendees. So I think this is going strong. Maybe you want to comment <laughs> the you. results uh, of the poll? A yeah. Little bit, or? Yeah, thank, I'm, I'm going to comment the results of the poll, indeed. Um, I'm doing this poll, first of all, out of curiosity and also to tailor because I, I want to know which uh, of the techniques people usually find most useful. Um, and, and that's interesting because it's, it's really close. Uh, there is a little head for the ADRs. Uh, and I'm not surprised. And that's why I also started with ADRs because Usually it's one thing very easy to start doing. Most people are not doing it, and it's very easy to, to, to get your team working on that. So I put that at the top for that reason. The brain dump uh, and the overcommitting have less success overall, but um, in my opinion, they are also part of the Mikado method kind of, because if you use the Mikado method, you don't need to do brain dump and overcommitting. I just mentioned them because I found that you may not want to get into the Mikado method always. Uh, it's much more involving, and you can start easy with the brain dump and overcommitting, for example. And then, yeah, the rest is pretty much closed. So uh, you want to try a bit of everything. Uh, 
so well i recommend you to only pick one to get started with uh, because it's very easy to be overwhelmed by trying three techniques at once start with one just do that and see what what it leads you to and um and then decide on picking another one etc thank you very much nicolas um also for talk so let's go over to the questions um i'll pick the top one from pablo verges with five votes was there ever a situation where you gave up trying to tame a legacy code base and if there was such a case what was the reason for giving up uh yes <laughs> actually yes there there is uh, it's not technical reason. Um, it's uh, as more thing than programming. What really matters the the people and the human and most problems usually come from the people. It depends on the culture. Uh, legacy culture is something that exists for sure, um, and you may be working on a legacy code base where there is no intention in changing the way things are working. For different reasons, but I usually start by uh, trying to like ignite change, leading by example, uh, like just doing it myself, and then showing the the benefits to others, not forcing others to do the same, but showing oh this problem I don't have because look I did that isn't that nice? Well, I can teach you to do the same, and I'm I'm organizing some. Um, engineering retrospective this is very efficient for getting the engineers behind you but uh, if the business really doesn't want to hear about it maybe because they had a bad experience or really they don't have the culture and there is power plays in place then i would give up like you cannot help someone who really doesn't want to be helped uh, that will be a blocker excellent thank you so I'm going to take the second question. Uh, who is the Git commit history intended for? The developers, the reviewer, the maintainer, and how do you deal with those different users when dealing with commits? Yeah, that's an interesting question in the sense that I think you, the developer, uh, talking about your Git history, uh, have actually different roles even on your own uh, code. For example, I commit, and when I commit, I, um, I'm in developer mode, then I open eventually the PR, uh, and, and I, I will turn into a re reviewer mode. Usually before asking a review, I will do a quick, very quick self-review myself, just skim through the code and also look at the commits overall just to see, does it make sense? Uh, did I forget anything in, inside that could happen? Uh, so developer and reviewer may be the same person. Anyway, I would say that the Git history is mostly useful for the people in the future. So usually the people who will review. When I'm working, I... I take benefit of Git by having frequent saves so I can stop frequently at any time and, and ship something that is working uh, and free my brain, basically. I don't let, When I commit and I uh, commit everything, I stop fresh so I can think about the new changes I'm doing. But most of the commits' usefulness, I think, is for the people who review. People may be reviewing by commits, so not many people do that, but if you have very usually because the commits are not that good and easy to review. Uh, but if you do have a trail of uh, 50 commits, that's probably easier to review. I have experienced that people, reviewers, may be afraid of that many commits. And, and that's because they are used of big commits that are messy. And usually it's not a problem in practice. Um, if you have a strong opinion on how, how your history, Git history should look like, feel free to rebase at the end or squash everything. Um, I have no religion on this. Um, when you commit, what is the most important to me is to cons like to make everyone happy is to uh, you follow the common sense that you you will find information on how to make good commit messages, keep it short, keep it like go to the point and use the body to put more details eventually. Um, I like to illustrate the risk 
of this comet? Like, is this comet probably likely to break something or not? And this is also why a reason, a reason why I'm doing many comets, because when I'm refactoring and say I'm renaming something, I would do a comet because I can, I can get that out of the list of suspects of this is breaking the code, this has introduced a regression. Uh, and it makes other commits, which are actually doing changes, much smaller, so much easier to review, so much faster to find the culprits. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from myself. <laughs> I wrote down when you were talking about first over committing, then Mikado. I think you already explained. Uh, the question is, when do you use the one and when do you use the other one? Because you can't do over committing and Mikado at the same time. I can, I can tell you how, when I do uh, them. Over committing now, it's, I, I don't use a timer anymore, et cetera, because I, it was really to get me into the habits of doing smaller and more frequent commits. And now I'm happy with the way I commit because it has become like a second nature. I will, I told you I would rename and then I will do a commit. And I'm, sometimes I don't even think about it because I do it so often that it became natural. So I would say I do over commit a lot already when I work. Uh, and it turned out fine for my coworkers. They like my PRs, so uh, no worry about about that. Mikado method, I don't do that all the time. Most of the time, I will do the brain dump thing, which is which just means that I have a to do list on my side and I take notes of what I'm finding. But I don't do the linking and ordering. I will do Mikado method if I try to do something that is. Either I know it will be difficult because I have no idea what needs to be done. And the Mikado graph is, it's a dependency graph of what you need to do. So when I start and I really have no idea what needs to happen, I will start a Mikado graph. Uh, or if I already tried and didn't, and I feel I'm lost. I feel I've spent an hour on this and then I will feel, okay, let me try again. Uh, with a Mikado graph just to see where I'm going. And usually it's, it works because I'm restarting, so I have um, experience already with the code, and then I can do it better. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So then the next question, uh, do you see any difference in using ADR documents or writing down the architecture decision into Git commit? Or is it just a question of tooling? And if you see a difference, how do you make sure that ADR documents are up to date? Or how do you detect if an ADR is no longer valid? Uh, yeah, there are two, two, two great points here I need to talk about. So the um, comet body, basically, versus an ADR. Um, I would use a commit body to explain, to give more details on what I did in this commit. Uh, usually I don't spend so much time because I noticed that barely anyone uh, knows how to look uh, for the Git history and find Git commits and read the body of the message even. And I can tell that or tooling is not great for that. When you, if you're using GitHub, for example, and you look at that, it focuses on the diff, uh, but you don't, have an easy way to find, especially when you do a lot of commits, to find like the commit with the body message that matters. Usually people will use a PR description for that, and that is great. I love ADRs because they are version with your code. So when I'm working in my code base on my editor and I'm searching for something, I may find it and it will be here. It's like embedded knowledge in the code base, which is different from the comments, I will go. I will need to go and, and search for the commit in particular to find the information here. Or the pull request, I will need to go and search in the pull request uh, on the tool I'm using to find this information. Most of my time is spent on the editor with the code when I'm trying to figure out how things are working. Having that information in an ADR markdown file in the code makes it more likely I will find the answers. And the faster I find my answer, well, the less time I waste and the, and, and the better. That's for the first part. The, long, the second part, which is 
uh, how do you make sure ADRs are up to date or detect when they're no longer valid? And that's the beauty of it. I'm going to repeat that, but uh, you cannot be wrong and they don't get outdated uh, per definition because they capture the decision you have taken and that will always be true. What may happen is that you take another decision or you have taken another decision and you didn't document it, which is fine. You can write an ADR to capture the existing behavior once you find out the context that was explaining why you changed. But say you decide to use, I don't know, uh, that library, or I'm, we're going to use a jest for a running test, for example, in, in JavaScript. Okay, I'm explaining why, because I'm super familiar with it. It has a great washer mode. It, it can do snapshots and spies. I don't have to install anything. And that will be a great tool to use. Then later, turns out people are much more familiar with Mocha, for example, or we need to have more flexibility, or maybe Jest is not uh, fast enough. So we will change our test runner. I will do a new ADR. It's a new ADR, and there is a date in the ADR. And I will say, OK, now we're going to use Mocha at the, as the uh, test runner. And that new ADR will supersede the previous one. So how do you do that? If you're using the CLI tool, you can even tell that uh, tell the tool, put the number of the previous ADR and it will do the change for you. But basically it's in the previous ADR, you put the link to the new ADR. And in the new ADR, you say, well, this supersedes this past ADR. And so you have like a, a chain. Hopefully it doesn't happen very often, but in this new ADR, which is much more recent, you are saying, well, we have decided to change the, the tool that we were using because the context has changed uh, because now we have the tooling to do something better. So this is how you change decision. You will change your mind and you keep track of what happened through time. And hopefully when you read the first ADR, you have a link to the next one that is super sitting in and, and so on. Nice. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from Jason Cole. Do you practice the Feynman method? I find it really useful. Are you familiar I, with it? I, I have the, to look yeah, it that, up myself. That's what I think I've heard about that, but I'm not familiar with it. So I cannot really. So the answer is probably no, uh, because I no, I would need to look it up exactly. Maybe I'm doing part of it, but I'm not consciously doing the Feynman method. So thank you for sharing that. I'm going to have a look. OK, thank you. Then the next question is from Peter Gfader. Um, general question, how do you decide between rewrite the whole thing versus refactor for a new feature have, component system? Yeah, I have, uh, yeah, I have a definite answer on that, which is, uh, so especially if you talk about the system and or a big component. Um, the problem is rewrite. Rewrite is very tempting, but there is one problem. The problem is when people are using it and expect it to be the same, but you want to rewrite it because you want to make it better, easier to maintain or whatever reason. But the, the, the thing should still be the same. In that case, rewrite is a mistake because there will be a difference. Like if you, unless you really know what this thing is doing because you wrote it and you can reproduce the same, but it's very not the situation you're in. If you want to rewrite something because it's so hard and you cannot maintain that and you don't really understand what everything it's doing, but it is used by people and they don't intend these people to have the component change, just be improved. Don't rewrite. What will happen is you will get in a terrible mess. Uh, people will complain. It, it will be, like, it's a big mistake. There is one moment though where it's fine to rewrite. Uh, and that is when you, it's like the business decides that we're gonna do something different. Uh, maybe you have been working, we're doing that at Central, for example. There was V1 and that was a way for us to learn about how people are using it uh, and what they like, don't like. And then we decided to redo completely, like good parts of it, we just threw away and we rewrote them, but because it was not meant to be an exact replacement, it was different and it was clear for the business that it was different. It was better, supposed to be better, easier to maintain and everything you want, but 
different. Some features not supported anymore, new features, less bugs, but everyone is clear that it is a rewrite. Not just when only developers know it's a rewrite, it's, yeah, it smells. Okay, thank you very much. Another interesting question from Pablo Vergas regarding the ADRs. Um, to supersede an ADR, you have to be aware of the existing ADRs. And the question is, is now, how do you deal with it when you have hundreds of ADRs? Yeah, yeah exactly. So, and that's a, that's a mindset and it will pay off in everything you do with your uh, interacting with legacy code. It is hard to be perfect, especially because the thing you're working with is so complex, involving so many people, and there is so much knowledge lost, etc., that you cannot know in advance. And some tools and techniques may help you uh, reduce that risk, reduce that knowledge loss, etc. But ultimately, you cannot be perfect. So I would say, if you don't know, if there isn't one existing, that's fine. You still write your new ADR and it doesn't supersede the previous one you are not even aware of because there are hundreds and you don't know all of them and you cannot do that. Eventually someone uh, will, and maybe you later, you will find out that, oh, this was superseded by this one. They will find the two and say, hey, there is a conflict. Oh yes, this one is more recent. So of course, with the date, you know that the decision has changed. But the moment you find, the moment you learn that new information, this is when you should do the update. So it's fine. At this moment, you will fix it. You will put the link before and after and, and fix the problem for everyone else. It's really important to be in that mindset of it cannot, it's not perfect, but we're still doing something. We're not waiting for it to be perfect before doing anything. Um, and at least yourself, and if possible, try to lead by example and get others do that by showing them you can do that. When you learn something new, do something like do one small thing to improve. So progressively with time and with everyone hopefully starting doing that, uh, the, 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 the code you're working with will get better. And hopefully soon, like even if you have a big legacy code base. I've seen code base that are like millions lines of code. But even in that code base, what you're changing really depends on the size of your team. Uh, even if you're working on the 1 million lines of code and you're three or four developers, you're only touching a subset of it. So this subset is what matters. Uh, improve that incrementally as you go. And it's fine if it's not perfect. If It's fine if you don't have a better name for, for this thing yet. Just try to improve it a little bit from what you have learned. And then the next time someone else will get in and, and learn about that, they will do the same. Eventually it will be better. Thank you very much. And the last question, finally, uh, from Peter Quader. It's uh, related to your answer before. Have you seen the rewrite approach work and what made it successful? So you told already yeah. about your own company. Have you seen it at other companies as well? Uh, I've, I've seen m most of the times I've seen it fail. For example, in my previous company, uh, I inherited a system where, um, so it was on the payments part and we used to have a very old card system and uh, the team before me and I really say the team before me because it was disbanded for like one year and then they, they created a new team again. But that team, they tried to rewrite that car system to be much more efficient, to, to handle new features and to be more performant. And they tried to rewrite uh, and that was a mess. So we ended up, when I arrived, uh, we had two cards working in production and most of our clients were using the old one and uh, our website part of our website was using the new one the problem is uh, we kept adding features to the old one which was the one working historically and the new one that was better supposed to be better was way behind in terms of uh, bug fixes and mostly features like payment methods and everything that it could support. 
So I was in that position where, okay, I already have two systems in place and one is, is newer, but is lagging behind and all the people who work on that are gone. So it's legacy to me too, because of course it's, it's more modern, but it's still not documented and not well tested. It was in progress, clearly. What do we do? And the question was, do we create a third <laughs> system? Uh, I took a slightly different approach. Yes, we did ended up rewriting the old cart, but uh, we use what is called the, um, so it's popular under the name of strangler fig pattern. Uh, I Strangler fig pattern, people remember about the strangler part of it. It's a bit violent. It's not supposed to be that violent. So now when I talk about that, I would say progressive rewrite, replacement, um, or the ship of Theseus, but this is a bit more metaphysical. It's about the, um, for the well, I'm not going to get into this, but basically you put a proxy in front of the client that red, redirects stuff to the old stuff. And then you find a way to progressively rewrite the system and you redirect uh, some of the, of the work to the new stuff as you are implementing them and moving the behavior. Uh, it's great because you ship constantly to production. So if you introduce a, a, a divergence with the old system, you will know it right away. It may happen, but it will happen on a very small s section and you know what happens, so it's easy to correct. And then eventually at some point you are able to switch everything to the new one and you can remove the old one. So we did that. It's still not done, I think, uh, as of today, but they are live in production with the new system and they're about to remove the old systems. And uh, this is the rewrite approach that I've seen working, but it takes time, but it works. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there's another a uh, question which is more like a comment and i think uh, we can stop here and maybe discuss the the, the comment from stefan uh, in the wonder.me uh, room so thank you everyone for coming and listening and for asking and uh, I'll see you soon uh, to the next conference the next meeting uh, it's going to be on the end of the month for october uh, with alex bolborka and by the time we meet all on Wonder Mish, if you can follow us. Thank you. Okay, so for those who are leaving now, have a good evening. Bye bye. And for everyone else, see you right now on Wonder.me. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.